Hi everyone and warm welcome to Stockholm International Youth Science Seminar 2022. My name is Linnea Sommenimi and I am this year's project manager. Stockholm International Youth Science Seminar, or SIUS for short, brings young, prominent researchers for all, from all over the world here to Stockholm to present their work. And with this seminar, we hope to inspire young people around Sweden, but it's also a great tool for deepening and training your knowledge in scientific English. SIUS is uh, arranged by the Swedish Federation of Young Scientists, which is a non-profit organization that tries to increase the interest in natural science, mathematics and engineering among youth. And besides SIUS, we also do Utställningen, which is a competition for high school students. We do a cybersecurity project, we do scholarships, uh, teaching material, and we also support associations all around Sweden. So if you're a student watching this and you're interested in knowing more what events you can partake in, or if you're a teacher that wants to know more about our teaching material, please visit www.ugafoske.se. Um, today we will have three parts in SIAS and we will start out with the topic of sustainable engineering from household objects to outer space. We will have four uh, researchers presenting. The first one is Charmaine Williams from University of Pretoria in South Africa. Uh, the second presenter will be Stephanie Höfemann from Jugendforst in Germany. Uh, Konrad Fiske will be the next presenter. He is from Denmark and uh, came here from EU Contest for Young Scientists. And finally, we have Juna Simonsson from Research Council of Norway. If you want to know more about their projects, we also have their posters, reports and abstracts available on our website. And that's at ungefoske.se slash uh, Next to the broadcasting, we also have a link to a questionnaire where you can ask your questions directly to the participants. So if you are watching today, the 9th of December, you will have until 4 p.m. to submit your questions. And the answers will be sent to you this evening to your signed up teacher. And with that, I just want to say once again, warm welcome to SIAS. And let's start with the first presenter. Hello everyone, my name is Charmaine Williams and I am from South Africa where I am studying veterinary sciences at the University of Pretoria on the UP Derek Ray Award. I love animals in all forms and when I was in high school I carried out a research project to test if insects, specifically larvae of the greater wax moth called waxworms, could help address plastic pollution. So today I will be telling you about these fantastic insects, their unique roles in pollution and as pests, as well as how these two crucial aspects are actually linked. So my project title was the feasibility of using Galeria melanella larva as a means to address plastic pollution. I'm sure we have all heard of why bees are important. To quickly sum it up, they are among the insects that act as cross-pollinators in the environment. When bees fly between plants, they transfer pollen from the stamen of one flower to the stigma of the next. A large number of plants in agriculture and in the ecosystem as a whole depends on cross-pollination to successfully reproduce. Now, waxworms link to bees because they naturally feed on the bees' wax and hives. As they feed, they tunnel through the wax, leaving a trail of silk behind them. This both damages the structure of the hive and kills bees when they become entangled in the silk. The waxworms I focused on were larvae of a specific species of wax moth called Galeria melanella or the greater wax moth. What is distinctive about this species is that they have the ability to ingest and digest polyethylene plastic, the kind you normally find in shopping bags and everyday materials, into biodegradable glycol compounds. This means that they can convert potentially dangerous materials that don't decompose into a less harmful form which will eventually break down. So when this was initially discovered, scientists jumped at the opportunity and started researching these insects. What they found was that certain strains of bacteria in their intestines were responsible for breaking down the polyethylene plastic. 
The downside to this was that it happened very slowly outside of a living wax worm. Living larvae were able to break down plastic much faster than when isolated bacteria was grown on polyethylene sheets. What is more is that these larvae are very small, but during the experiments ate a large amount of plastic in a very short time. Now, despite these findings, progress slowed. The web saw surgeon interested, surprised, and notably skeptical articles. Why would anyone risk using living larvae in a natural setting to biodegrade plastic? What if they spread to hives? How high was the risk that rather than assisting with clearing up pollution, wax would do tremendous damage to already threatened bee colonies? So time went by, and a few years later, an unrelated study found that certain kinds of coral ate plastic rather than its natural foodstuffs due to a chemical that the plastic released. Waxmoth larvae and corals are not closely related, but despite this, both these animals had consumed plastic materials during experiments with minimal prompting. And that brings me to my research. I decided to test if waxworms, like corals, ate plastic preferentially to its natural food, namely beeswax. I theorized that considering it was already proven that they could metabolize plastic and unwillingly eaten it in tests, they, like the corals, would prefer polyethylene plastic to their natural food. Now, if this was proven to be true, their potential as a biological means of addressing pollution would be significant and very importantly, time sensitive. So I designed two very simple experiments to test this. One, similar to the research done, was to establish how much plastic they could eat within a certain time frame, but also how this compared to their beeswax eating abilities. How close these two values were would help to indicate whether the larvae view the plastic as a food source or if there was some other reason for their behavior. So in this experiment, I weighed samples of polyethylene plastic and beeswax and placed them into two separate containers. I then placed equal numbers of roughly equally sized larvae into each container, and after 21 hours, I removed the larvae, cleaned the materials, and reweighed them. Throughout the process, I recorded these values, and afterwards, I compiled charts. Now, the second experiment was to confirm the findings of the first by observing these larvae in a pseudo-natural setting. These results would help indicate the larvae's instincts toward plastic, an important aspect should they be used in the natural environment. So in this experiment, I placed polyethylene plastic and beeswax samples on opposite sides of the same container, and then I added wax moth larvae to it, 18 specifically. For 40 minutes, I observed the larvae, and I noted down their behavior. So these are my results. In the first experiment, 650 milligrams of beeswax was consumed, but only 20 milligrams of polyethylene plastic was eaten. In the second experiment, 15 of the 18 larvae immediately crawled to and started eating the beeswax, but only three of them crawled towards the polyethylene plastic, and they did not eat it. So both studies indicated that these larvae preferentially eat beeswax over plastic, leading me to conclude that it would not be environmentally safe to use living larvae to address plastic pollution. The results of my research project, however, do not mean that these insects do not still have a part to play in cleaning the planet. Insects are the most abundant animals on Earth, and wax moth larvae specifically are found all over the world where beehives exist. Their unique physiology and metabolic abilities may yet lend them a part in cleaning the planet. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Stephanie, I'm 19 years old and I come from Germany. My project, Water Music, Tuning Bottles Easily, is a combination of music and science. Um, as you know, I have a great interest in science. But besides science, I've always loved making music and playing the piano. And while making music as a little girl, I had the idea of using such bottles as instruments by blowing into them. But before you can make music with these bottles, you have to find a way of tuning them by filling different amounts of water into them. And suddenly, last year, the idea of being able to calculate these frequencies and simplify this process of tuning fascinated me. And so, in my project, I considered the question of how the size of a bottle and its filling level with water influence the sound that is produced by blowing into the bottle. And I looked at the tune pitches as well as the timbres. I concentrated on bottles with a cylindrical bottle body and a conical bottle neck because this shape allows a very easy calculation of the water level 
via the mass of water. And I then measured the corresponding air column heights inside the bottles and the air volumes for the different frequencies produced by blowing into the bottle. Um, the frequency is decisive for the pitch we perceive. This means if the frequency is higher, the pitch also increases and the tone sounds higher. Moreover, I recorded the sounds and used the resulting frequency spectra to compare the timbre. The timbre describes the entire sound. So, for example, you might know that a trumpet has a very different timbre than a flute, even if both instruments play the same tone. And I then evaluated all my measured values graphically. And there I found the proportionality between the frequency and the inverse of the height of the air column as long as the water is still in the bottle body. So this diagram shows the inverse of the height of the air column on the horizontal axis and the frequency on the vertical axis. And my measured values reside in a straight line through the origin. This means that the quotient, which is the frequency multiplied by the height of the air column, is constant. And here in my presentation, the frequency is abbreviated with F, and the height of the air column is abbreviated with HA. So this diagram shows that less water, and thus a higher air column, leads to a lower frequency. And with the help of this constant quotient S, the corresponding air column height can be calculated for each frequency. And knowing the inner height of the bottle, as well as the height of the air column for a certain frequency, I can determine the mass of water to be filled in by this equation. But however, the quotient is only constant if the water is, is in the bottleneck, so this equation only applies if the water is in the bottle body. Um, but the quotient depends on the bottle radius and decreases with increasing radius. This means to get the same tone pitch in bottles of different radii, the bigger the radius is, the smaller the height of the air column becomes. But since this proportionality no longer applies if the water is up to the bottleneck, I investigated how air volume and frequency relate to each other. And the frequency is proportional to the inverse of the square root of the air volume, which is here abbreviated with VA. This can be seen by the straight line to the origin in the diagram with the inverse of the square root of the air volume on the x-axis and the frequency on the y-axis. So this diagram shows again that less water leads to a lower frequency. And by means of this constant quotient Q, which is the frequency multiplied by the square root of the air volume, the corresponding air volume, and thus the mass of water to be filled in, can be calculated for each frequency both by means of this equation. And um, however, this quotient is only constant if the water is up to the bottleneck. So this equation only applies if the water reaches into the bottleneck. In a further experiment, I examined the timbre of the sounds, as you knew, as you knew the wide range of timbre for musical projects. And how the human ear perceives a sound is widely dependent on the spectrum of frequencies that the sound is composed of. With an increasing proportion of audible overtones, the sound becomes brighter and harsher, and a higher proportion of audible overtones can be seen by more frequency peaks in the, di in the frequency spectrum. In identical bottles, the proportion of audible overtones rises with increasing tone pitch. Um, so these two diagrams show the frequency spectra of the musical tones C3 and C4. Um, the fundamental frequency belonging to the graphic on the right side is twice as high as the fundamental frequency belonging to the graphic on the left side, as this tone sounds an octave higher. And as you can see, the C4 shows more frequency and uh, more frequency peaks and a broader frequency spectrum. So with increasing tone pitch, the sound thus becomes brighter. These two graphics, on the other hand, show um, the frequency spectra of the same tone pitch in bottles of different radii. And as you can see, there are no big differences within the proportion of audible overtones, so this leads to a very similar timbre here. So, to conclude, um, I can calculate the mass of water to be filled in for all frequencies via the height of the air column or by the air volume. But using different bottles cannot vary the timbre for a given pitch, so the following applies for all bottles. The higher the tone is, the harsher becomes the sound. 
I really hope my creations can inspire you to play music with such bottles. And in case somebody starts a bottle orchestra or a bottle collection, I would love to see a tier the results. Well, hello. My name is Conrad. I'm from Denmark. And I've written a project called Integration of the Protein D-Sub in the single-celled algae Nanochloropsis oceanica. And it's all about food on Mars. But the whole thing started during Corona lockdown, as uh, many other students all over the world, students in Denmark, were sent home from school. And that's boring. That is unbelievable boring. And, and when you're on that board, and you can't even stay in it for just one minute more, then you slowly take down your microscope from your dusty shelf and start looking at moss samples from your garden. Or at least that was what I did. And in this moss, I found these guys uh, called Tard grates. In Swedish, it's called Bjørndyr, and um, this little fellow is probably the toughest animal you are ever going to meet. They are very tiny, about 0.1 millimeter long, and then they can be found in almost every garden in both Denmark and Sweden. Um, and then they are almost impossible to kill. You can try to boil them; they don't care. You can. Uh, totally dry them out for 150 years and when giving them water again they just return to their usual business as if nothing had happened. These little animals had even been sent to space unprotected and survived. But what is really interesting about tardigrades is their incredible ability to survive very high amounts of ionizing radiation. And for those of you who are not familiar with this term, Ionizing radiation is just radiation with uh, high enough energy to break down molecules. And this can be dangerous to life. When a cell is hit by ionizing radiation, the DNA of the cell is damaged. Uh, it can be break down. Um, and when enough DNA damage occurs in a cell, the cell will eventually die. The whole machinery just breaks down and everything in the cell stops working, so the cell dies. So what the tardigrade does to protect its DNA is that it uh, uh, express a protein called D-sub. It's short for damage suppressor. And what this protein does, it does that it kind of wraps around the DNA, protecting it, shielding it against the ionizing radiation. So it's the protein that gets damaged instead of the DNA. And in this way, the tardigrade will not be harmed. The damage of the DNA has been suppressed. From space and sun, uh, a lot of ionizing radiation is generated. And luckily here on Earth, we are protected uh, from this by our magnetic field. However, on Mars, I learned, the magnetic field is so weak that almost all of the radiation from space hits the surface, resulting in a 50 times higher radiation level than we find it on Earth. Both NASA and SpaceX plan to send the first main mission to this irradiated planet within the next 10 to 20 years. So I thought, couldn't this protein be used to protect something alive on Mars? Well, the next living thing that's going to Mars is humans and the stuff they're going to eat. Um, and I'm not going to genetically modify humans, so I will try with the food. And then you have to find out what is a good mass crop. Well, first of all, it is something that was both nutritious, easy and reliable to grow, and are able to produce a lot of food. Um, and the best candidate for this job I found is actually microalgae. And this uh, little algae, consisting of only one cell per organism, is very, very nutritious. They contain almost all the stuff that humans uh, need to stay alive and grow. And then these algae are very, very easy to grow too. 
and have a very high biomass production, meaning they can produce a lot of food. Well, so now I probably have just to take the algae and the tardigrade and smash them together, and then the dinner is served on Mars. But unfortunately, this is science, so it's not that simple. First, you have to make something called a DNA construct, which is a long strand of DNA consisting of several different genes that will be needed in order to insert this one single gene of interest in the algae. Then we use something called a method called electroporation, which what you basically do is that you mix algae and DNA and then apply a electrical shock um, which opens tiny holes in the cell membrane of the algae through where the DNA can float in and the algae can start to express this um, protein. Finally, we can then expose the genetically modified algae to ionizing radiation. And what we hope to see is that the algae that uh, produce this protein uh, show also a higher tolerance against ionizing radiation compared to the algae that don't express this protein. So currently, I am conducting these experiments in the lab of Copenhagen University in uh, cooperation with two scientists. Um, and unfortunately, we are not far enough in the experiments yet to conclude anything. But um, the so far, the um, experiment has been very promising. Nothing had gone wrong so far. And um, hopefully we will have the first clear results uh, in the beginning of next year. So thank you for your time. That was my project. Hi, my name is Juna Simonsen. I'm 20 years old from Norway. In my last year of high school, I worked on a project about foam and what influences the foaming abilities of different tent sites. Today, I'm going to talk to you about my, my inspiration for this project, the general principles of foam, my research and how I did it, and what I learned from this project. The inspiration for this project came from my interest in everyday chemical phenomena such as foam. We all surround ourselves with foaming substances every day, maybe even without thinking about it. I worked on my project during the pandemic, and the frequent use of hand soap was one of the things spiking my interest to know more about soap and its foaming abilities. So, what actually is foam? So, foam is defined as a liquid or a solid with a certain amount of bubbles with gas. In order to give a liquid such as water foaming abilities, it has to contain a certain amount of surface active agents, also known as surfactants or tensides, which we may be most commonly find in soaps. So there are four main types of tensides, which all share the same general chemical structure, as I've shown here to the left. The tensides have a hydrophobic end, a water-hating end, and a hydrophilic end, a water-loving end. This means that when the tensides are put into water or a liquid, they will form a membrane on the surface of the liquid. This membrane gives the water surface a more elastic structure. If you then also mix air into the liquid, then the tensides will form membranes around the air bubbles as well, and then foam is formed. So, in my project, I research how the foaming abilities of three different soaps were affected by the concentration of soap in the liquid, the water temperature in the liquid, the salt concentration in the liquid, and the hardness of the soap and the hardness of the water in the liquid. So, how do we test foam, you ask? I use this homemade replication of the so-called Ross Miles method. So I mixed together a soap solution of 250 milliliters. Then I poured 50 milliliters of this solution down into the measuring cylinder here. And then after that, I poured the remaining 200 milliliters of the mixture from a height of 90 centimeters through a funnel. So it fell all the way down into the measuring cylinder. The, 
There, the two mixtures turbulently mix, much like we see in waterfalls in rivers. After that, I measured the height of the foam occurring in the measuring cylinder, here shown from point C to D. So, what did my research show? So, these graphs show the results from my, uh, from my research. Both the green and the yellow line are soaps containing only one type of tensite, and the green and the uh, blue line is a soap containing three different types of tensites. The results overall showed that the dish soap, the blue line, had a generally more stable forming ability than the other soaps. This may be because the multiple types of tensites it contains have different chemical abilities and therefore together give the dish soap a stronger foaming abilities in, in, in varying environments than the other two soaps. So, what did I learn from this project? First of all, I learned a lot more about the chemical phenomenon foam and what influences the foaming abilities of different tensites. This research and these results may be relevant when finding the optimal tensite for a specific use in a special environment. The knowledge about chemicals in general is also important because it may contribute to a more conscious envir and environmentally favorable use of them. Thank you.